rise and receive the call to worship. <clears throat> Welcome all those who are with us as a congregation. We pray that you will be blessed tonight as we worship in the spirit and truth of Jesus Christ with an open Bible, an open mind, and an open heart to these things. May God bless us together. The call to worship the God who is worthy to be worshipped has to do with the celebration of the psalmist of the ascension of Christ. Here is what the psalmist in Psalm 47 says about the ascension of Christ of which we will speak tonight. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. May God bless us tonight, the God who made heaven and earth and who has redeemed us by the blood of Jesus Christ. Receive God's benediction for our worship. Grace, mercy, and peace be richly multiplied unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue our worship in song number 181 in the Psalter hymnal. Jehovah sits enthroned, of course, he's the king. Four stanzas, 181. to remain standing and, and recite the Apostles' Creed. For those of you who don't know that creed, who might be visiting and new to church altogether, it's on page three of the back of the Psalter hymnal, little three in the top right-hand corner, under ecumenical creeds. The subject is all of the, the creeds that the Spirit led the church to write because the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Ascended Lord, is the spirit of truth. And the truth is, well, the apostolic faith that we recite. And believer, I ask you the question, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father, almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue our worship, staying uh, standing, number 124, God shall arise and by his might. Here is a, one of the several psalms that foreshadows the ascension of Jesus Christ, God arising and by his might, putting all his enemies to, fl to flight. Let's sing stanzas 1, 2, and 3 of 124. Yeah. 
God, the Lord loves your songs. He loves your singing unto him. He loves this, the song of the congregation. And when we sing together, when there's unity and there's harmony, reflecting the nature of the communion of the body of Christ, one in faith, different gifts, different personalities, different backgrounds, and God is good to us all. What a great God we can celebrate. This, for believers, is where we belong, in the Church of Christ. May we not only feel comfortable here, but may we know the comfort of Jesus Christ together. Whether we're here visiting or whether we're part of the congregation, whether we're tuned in on the Internet, there's a place which is called home for the people of God. It's the Church of Christ in the arms of God. Let's now commit our, ourselves to God and one another also as we pray together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you're here with us. In the spirit and grace and word of Jesus Christ, your ascended Son who is at your right hand, you're not only here with us, but you hear us. You hear our prayers for the sake of Jesus. And though we cannot see you, we believe, and we believe that you are the God with, who's all ears because you love us and you hear everything that we would say and then some. You hear even our groanings, our needs that we cannot express, you know. You are the God who cares for us with omnipotence and omniscience. You know everything about us, even as you've known us before the foundation of the world. In your electing love and decree, choosing us to be yours in Jesus Christ. You know us now, Father, because we're the ones for whom Jesus came and died and suffered and is risen and is ascended. And our names are on the palms of your hands and you call us by name and you're calling us right now. This one, that one, come my son, come my daughter, Come, my little one, come, my aged one, come, my troubled ones, and hear from me of the balm of Gilead. Come, you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Come, you sheep, into my arms, the arms of the good shepherd. Come, you friendless, you find a friend in Jesus. Come, you sinners, there's forgiveness with me. Come, you sinners, who are unrepentant and repent and come and hear the promise once again that you are the God who forgives sinners and you are the one who works repentance so we know that we are forgiven. Bless this congregation, Lord, as we hear tonight of the ascension of Jesus Christ. May we give glory to you in this great event. Jesus is lifted up on high, all glory to him. And we pray that we may even exalt you in this congregation which is in the world. <clears throat> or as the Bible itself describes this world, it's a wilderness, a waste, howling wilderness. There is no water here, nothing here below that could satisfy our souls. There's only trouble, there's only crevasses, there's only scorpions, and there's that flood of the devil himself whereby he would... He would engulf us and immerse us and drown us with lies. We pray, Father, bless us in this situation. You have pledged, according to your Son's own high priestly prayer, to leave us in the world. Lord, we know, too, you will not leave us comfortless. You will not leave us without grace. You'll give us hope and joy and purpose, and you will... Continue to be with us, though we so often fail you. Lord, bless this congregation and our individual members. Every member thrive by faith. It's not what we can see, it's what we believe, the promises of God. And Lord, you work out so often contrary to what we would do. You are the God whose ways are higher than ours, thoughts are higher than ours. And you have a perfect plan and it's often through trials, it's often through those things that interfere with what we would call our peaceful life, 
simply because you want us to believe more. Without the trials, we would simply take things for granted, and we would even take Jesus for granted as if we didn't need him anymore. Lord, if trials is the way it must be, send them on, Father, but send grace with them. In the way of escape, when the trials become temptations, so that we cannot fall, but we may rise above the fray and declare the glories of Jesus in following him. Bless, Lord, us as single people. We pray your blessing so that we can know your, your will for us. It be single life or marriage. You lead a spouse to us, a male or a female, in the Lord. God, we pray that we may recognize your leading. You may be glad for us in whatever situation of life, single or seeking to be married or younger or older. These things, Father, as young adults are often difficult times of year of of, of our life. But Lord, we know that you are the God who leads us through that we might be strong in faith and in courage and not rely on the strength, even the mighty strength of our youth. We pray, Father, to rely on you in all the difficult things and all of the successful things of life. And our families, too, bless the families of Sovereign Grace Church. Thanks, Lord, for godly men and women who are married in the Lord and who would raise a covenant seed. And to do this diligently, and it shows in the schooling, whether we educate them in our homes or in Christian schools, shows also in the catechism. There is a good report that the elder and the pastor can give of the catechism. The children are being taught well, first at home, and also by the Holy Spirit. And now we are privileged to engage on the behalf of Jesus and the parents in that education. So bless us, Lord, and continue to, to be a school here for us, to teach us. We want to sit at Jesus' feet and learn of him. As we heard this evening, our call to worship is that we might praise with understanding. May our minds be enlightened. May we be challenged, encouraged in the things old and new of the gospel. Bless your servant. We thank you for him. We thank you that he loves you. And this is so clear. We thank you that he loves Jesus, that he loves the word of God, that he loves the people of God. He loves to be there when the shepherd, the sheep need, need help from Jesus himself or when they go astray. We thank you for godly elders. We thank you that they are under shepherds with the pastor in the government of the church and in the shepherding with the word of God. We thank you for faithful deacons who love you and who love mercy and who show this not only in their personal life, but in the congregation and in the community. We thank you, Lord, for each one and all the gifts we have manifest in all the committees and all the doing. And thank you for the, the good turnout yesterday and the beautiful property you've given us. And we seek to take care of this as we can. For all who are involved in home and in all ways and in everything, praying for us, for our prosperity in the Lord the spiritual blessings that are in Christ Jesus to be known here. May the truth prevail, Father. May the truth be declared powerfully, tenderly, and to the heart. that We can know even Jesus shepherding us from heaven. We pray, Father, your blessing upon those who could not be with us, who for one reason or another are sick or, or who are those who are infirm in one way or another. We pray especially now for Daniel Wasorek, who is out of sorts. We pray for that young man, that you would help him, Lord, to come to stronger faith and to have courage, to be not depressed, but full of joy in the Lord. Bless him and remind us all of what a joy it is for us to have him in the congregation, as it is for the Wasoreks and their family. A joy for these 47 years, these years you have given him to be a great blessing to all that he knows, also wherever he works. And we pray, Father, have mercy that we can be more grateful for such as that. We're evident uh, examples of the fact that you save not the mighty, not the wise, not the smart. You save sinners, and we're all there. 
And we pray, Father, to be grateful for all the ways you bless us in all of our congregational life. We thank you, Lord, that you give, that we can have a ministry at Calvin University and that this too could bear good fruit. Thank you for marriage, the DeWins newly married, and Paul and Josie who seek to be married soon. And, and all of us, Lord, have been married recently or many, many years ago. What a great blessing are these things. The blessings also we have in, in so many ways in our country. We thank you for freedom. We pray that you would encourage that freedom among politicians who would recognize something of the righteousness of the law of God and of God himself and would themselves be converted, that we might have God fears in positions of power. Lord, we know this is not how the kingdom comes by might and by power, but by the spirit of Christ. But you use even the freedoms we have that we can serve you and do the mission of the church here and wherever you give us to, to go. Bless those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, Lord. The heat is on, the flood of the, the waters of the, the foul waters, the muddy waters of the devil is, is spewed out in the world, and there's such evil, and there's so many lies. Keep us from them, keep us from the mark of the beast. May we not be unto Christ, but for him. So bless our Bible study that concerns these things of Antichrist and being for Christ. This, Sunday, this Wednesday, the consistory as it meets soon. Bless us all, Father, in the season of spring as the students uh, wrap up their studies and, and as we go into the summer months, we pray to rest in you, you know, recre recreation be recreation, and everything serving the Lord. Forgive our many sins, even of this prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We would worship the Lord now in the giving of an offering, which we call for the general fund, and that primarily is for the preaching of the gospel. May God bless us. We hear the word, we respond to uh, supporting, maintaining the gospel ministry among us. God bless you and all of us as we give. Let's rise and sing now number 42 in the Psalter hymnal, and this is entitled, Ye Gates Lift Your Heads, and again, it's an ascension psalm, so we'll sing these three stanzas of 42, and remember the angels who themselves were amazed at the entrance of Christ into heaven, 42, three stanzas. Oh, 
we would consider the history and the doctrine of the ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven in our evening service tonight. And this is what we would do in response to the churches confessing that Jesus ascended into heaven after he rose from the dead and after he had been crucified, he ascended into heaven. A separate and important element of the creed of the church is Jesus' ascension. So important, the creeds of the church throughout, the Protestant creeds and also Roman Catholic ones themselves, have something to say about this ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. We're not inventing new doctrine here, but based on the word of God, the church has been led to confess a certain thing, certain things about the ascension of Jesus. I want you to turn with me to Lord's Day 18 in the Heidelberg Catechism of uh, pages 24 and 25 in the back of your Psalters, Lord's Day 18, where there are four questions and answers designed to catechize us or instruct us and our children in these wonderful truths of the ascension of Jesus. And the first is, what's the meaning of it? What do you mean when you say he ascended into heaven? Here's what we mean, that Christ, while his disciples watched, was lifted up from the earth into heaven and will be there for our good until he comes again to judge the living and the dead. So he ascends and he will be there for our good until the judgment day at the end of time. But then, question 47, isn't Christ with us until the end of the world as he promised us? Christ is true man, the answer says, and true God. In his human nature, Christ is not now on earth, but in his divinity, majesty, grace, and spirit, he is not absent from us for a moment. And then this question that has to do with some doctrinal controversy If his humanity is not present wherever his divinity is, then aren't the two natures of Christ separated from each other? You have two beings here now that Jesus is ascended to heaven? And the answer is certainly not. Since divinity is not limited and is present everywhere, and it is evident that Christ's divinity is surely beyond the bounds of the humanity he's taken on, But at the same time, his divinity is in and remains personally united to his humanity. Here's the question. Jesus Christ is ascended in his humanity. Is he separated somehow from himself in his Godhead here on earth? No, that's not the case because there's an inseparable union, a mysterious one to be sure, but inseparable between Christ in his humanity and Christ in his divinity. Christ in heaven and Christ here on earth in his divinity. How does Christ's ascension into heaven benefit us? The last question. First, he pleads our cause in heaven in the presence of his Father. Second, we have our own flesh in heaven, a guarantee that Christ our head will take us, his members, to himself in heaven. And third, from heaven he sends his Spirit to us on earth as a further guarantee By the Spirit's power, we make the goal of our lives not earthly things, but the things above where Christ is, sitting at God's right hand. So there's a rather lengthy Lord's Day on these things that are comforting, historical, doctrinal, and also controversial. We will only glean a few of the things of the ascension in this sermon tonight. For our help and for perspective tonight, I want us to look at Revelation 12, which we studied last in our Bible study, and want to focus on the ascension that's brought out there in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 12, and especially we will concentrate on verses 5 and 6, verses 5 and 6, but here let's read for context's sake of a great sign in heaven that appeared to John. Now a great sign appeared in heaven woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. This is a picture, as we've seen in our studies, 
of the Old Testament church who was going to give birth to Jesus Christ in the fullness of time in Bethlehem. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great and fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a man-child, a male child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, and now we have the identity of the dragon, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, that's the devil, who accused them before our God, day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, the church. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, and that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she's nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Thus far we read the sacred word of God, mysterious indeed, but a great revelation, light, light, especially on the ascension of Jesus, as we read in verses 5 and 6. The church bore a male child. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Beloved, As I said in the introduction prior to this part of the introduction, the ascension is a wonderful truth. It is great. It is celebrated throughout the scripture as we shall see. It is what Jesus did and was done to him after 40 days after his resurrection. He had been going teaching about uh, teaching the disciples of the things of the kingdom of heaven. And then He was taken up out of their sight as he's teaching them on Mount Olivet and blessing them, and a cloud receives him out of their sight. The disciples are wondering, they're craning their necks, and the angels, the two men in white who visit them at this time, they tell them to stop staring, to stop thinking that this is hopeless. There was something about that look of theirs of forlornness and longing to have him back. The angels say, don't do that. Because this is an assurance, this is what they meant, that this will be the way he returns as well. He's going, but he's going to come again with glory. Clouds symbolizing the glory of the great mediator of the cross. Well, beloved, this is celebrated also in this revelation that John has. You will note that the one thing that's said of Jesus after he's born... He was being persecuted by the devil. The devil sought to snatch him out of this earth. The one thing that is said is that the child of the woman 
or, or the child of the, the church, the woman, was to rule, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, her child was caught up to God and his throne. The word literally is snatched up as by force. The child, Jesus, was caught up to God and to his throne. That's the perspective of Revelation 12. You will note that there are no other details given of Jesus' birth, of his ministry on earth, of his death on the cross, or of his resurrection. Just this detail, he was caught up to God and to his throne. So important is the ascension of Jesus that this is the only thing that Revelation 12 would emphasize. John must know this for his comfort, and the church must as well. Because the ascension is a great truth, and it's great glory for Jesus, but we have a problem here on earth, because we're also taught that the woman is left without her Jesus in body. She's left for the devil, and seemingly to be a prey of the devil in this place called the wilderness. And so it seems as if Christ gets all the glory, but there's a disturbing fact that he's no longer with us, even as he promised, but the devil himself is with us, and that surely is a problem. So we want to consider, from the perspective of Revelation 12, the ascension of Christ caught up to God in his throne. Listen for this. Listen for the ascension truth. That will be the main doctrine. But listen also for how the church in the wilderness not only uh, survives in the wilderness, though her head be in heaven, she also thrives and is able to witness of the glorious ascension glories of Jesus himself. And so, basically, beloved, I am seeking from you, and God is seeking from all of us, this reaction to the wonderful ascension of Jesus. It's this, that we say, glory, glory, hallelujah. No matter what we're going through in life, no matter what it looks like here below, whether it's a sunny spring day or a rainy day or there's a tornado coming by, whether we are having problems in our soul dealing with life in this wilderness, makes no difference if only we cling to the truth of the ascended Savior. The sufficiency of his grace in our wilderness wanderings and also the glories that are ours now and that await us because he's ascended. So we want to be able to answer the question asked by God himself of the church, of you today. Do you say glory, glory, hallelujah to God in reaction to a sermon not only, but to all of God's promises. Is our witness of the great ascension something that we're always saying and doing the word of glory, glory, hallelujah? Jesus Christ, the great Son of God, is ascended into heaven. The narrative in Acts is clear, chapter 1. The disciples are looking at Jesus, and Luke 24 tells us they're on Mount Olivet, and Jesus is blessing them, and Jesus goes up, never to return to the earth until the end of time. There's a great distinction, therefore, between his resurrection and his ascension. We should not muddle over the two as if resurrection and ascension are all one. These are two distinct events. Jesus Christ dies, then he's risen, and that's his first elevation in glory. But he needs to ascend, to go up into heaven, to take his rightful place there as the king of kings. Even as Revelation reminds us in verse 5 of chapter 12, the woman bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron was destined to rule all nations with a rod of iron, was identified by God the Father as the one who was appointed to rule all nations with a rod of iron, which means absolute rule, sovereign rule, almighty rule, rule and authority that's given to him 
now that he's been crucified and satisfied the justice of God and is risen, the ascension confirms all of this. So, God has been saying, glory, glory, hallelujah to my son, because God loves his son, and he wants him to have the glory. Remember, Jesus himself was praying that he would be returned to glory in John 17, just before he's betrayed and then crucified and forsaken of God on the cross. He prays that this may be something that happens. The glory that he had with the Father before the world was and when he was in uh, this wonderful, felicitous uh, uh, communion with God, this happy, happy Trinity communion before he was one who took on human flesh. This glory is given to him. God made the worlds that in all things he might have the preeminence, and here in the ascension we see it. All the nations, he's to rule all the nations, they will not have any eminence compared to him who's the highest of the mountains, as we would say, the highest of the beings, being God himself with us, Emmanuel. And Jesus Christ was the one <clears throat> endeavoring to say glory, glory, hallelujah, in his own glorification at the right hand of God for which he prayed that night he was betrayed. And so it is. The psalmist of old speak of it. The word of God gets in on this one desire, expresses the one desire of the Spirit of Christ who was in them speaking that there might be glory to the Son. You have in Psalm 24, Psalm 47, Psalm 68, for example, Ascension Psalms. And they celebrate the victory of the king and that we are to observe the fact that God has risen and we are to shout about it as is, was our call to worship. God has arised, uh, arisen, so let us shout and let us clap. And the angels themselves are pictured in Psalm 24, I believe, as those who are waiting for him to come. And they are in awe of this Son of God's coming into heaven to take the throne next to the Father at the right hand of the Father. And they, they are marveling at his glory. He's one in human nature, but it's his glory that he has that calls them to say, now who is this King of glory? Who is this King of glory? The Lord, God, strong and mighty, he is this king of glory. The Old Testament also has other types, we call them. The Bible calls these symbols, types, also of the ascension of Jesus Christ. Remember in 2 Samuel 6, also 1 Chronicles 13 through 16, the ascension of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was a symbol of the presence of God. Jesus Christ is the presence of God. So where the ark goes, you have a symbol of God with the people in Jesus to come. And so when the ark rises and is taken up by King David into the, the place of worship on the mount in, in Mount Zion, there is a picture of the ascension. And the celebration at that time of Israel and, and David's dancing before the ark is is symbolic of the great benefits and blessings and reaction of the people of God to this great ascension of Jesus Christ himself. Other types we could just hint at because they are pretty evident in the Bible that they are important is, for example, the ascension of Moses to the Mount Sinai. When there's clouds there and the veil of God's own being is, is shrouding out sight, but at the same time revealing just how great God is. So Moses goes up repeatedly, and, and then the 70 elders with him in the book of Exodus chapter 29, 24, I think, is where this picture of God's people picturing the Christ himself would send into the presence of God, and Moses is a picture of, of the mediator of the Old Testament. And so the, the Bible is anticipating this thing. The great exaltation of the Son of God. This is what he deserves. 
for himself there's great glory. In fact, at this time, he is celebrated as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Here is how he is described in chapter 19 of Revelation. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Our text in chapter 12. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. This is what happened when Jesus ascended. He has declared, he's given this name, King of kings, Lord of lords. Which means he's the only king and the only Lord over all things, all the nations, all the good, all the evil, their servants. And he is good. And he is wise and he is powerful down to the details of your life and mine. If only this world would understand that when we're born, we're made of God. And even before that, we're fearfully, wonderfully made in the womb. And God perfectly as it planned and makes us and forms us to be just the person he wants us to be, just the sex, male or female, just the size, small, medium, large, just with just the intelligence, with just the parents, with just the right time, in just the right time, just the right circumstances, God does all that. Now, that's what the Puritans would call meticulous providence, the careful providence of God. Everything shaped by his hand, everything ordained, everything prepared, even this place in the wilderness is said to be prepared. And this Son of God, who is to be the ruler with a rod of iron, is all prepared. That's what we believe in this church, sovereign grace church, Sovereign God Church, King of Kings Church, Lord of Lords Church, whatever else church could there be? The Word of God is clear. And down to the details and up to the stars, God is ruling. And Jesus Christ is the one to whom all power and authority is given. In the fulfillment of Psalm 2, the nations themselves are an inheritance for him. But then there's blessing in the wonderful truth of Jesus' ascension as we uh, have alluded to in Revelation 12 for the saints in heaven. It's an interesting phenomenon that occurred when Jesus went to heaven. You know, when Jesus went to heaven, it's described here that the, there was war that broke out. Verse 7, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. That is, the dragon and his angels didn't. Nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's why at that time there was joy in heaven, a loud voice saying, Now salvation and strength and kingdom, the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ have come. The accuser of the brethren who accuses night and day is cast out. What's going on here? Well, beloved, here was the case. Before Jesus ascended, heaven allowed devils to enter itself, to be there. Read the book of Job, chapter 1, maybe chapter 2, part of that too. The devil was allowed to communicate somehow with the beings up there, and this devil, who's always a liar and always an accuser of the brethren, would go up there. And this was all in the Old Testament, before Jesus died and before Jesus himself was risen and ascended. And the devil would go around and say to Moses, well, Moses, you sinned. And he'd say to Joshua, you were a sinner. And he'd say to Adam, you were the original sinner. And all of those he would say, because there was no atonement yet, you're unworthy to be in a place called the holy heaven. Why are you here? You're sinful. You were sinful on earth, and you have no right to be here. And you're God. He must not be so holy as as you think he is because, well, he accepts you like this and as you are and you're, and you're not atoned for. And so, well, 
Beloved, when Jesus gets to heaven, there's the one who died on the cross in heaven. There's the one who presents his blood, as it were, to the Father as an offering for all those saints in heaven and all of those elect people of God on earth. And the Father receives that great offering. And the devil now has nothing to accuse the saints of. They're covered. That's why Michael and the angels can prevail. They have a cause. That's why when the church has the truth, she always prevails. She has a cause. She has the word of God. So, in heaven, it's the same way. Michael and his angels, they fight. The devil cannot prevail that liar from the beginning. He's kicked out of heaven. He has no right to be there. And the saints do have a right to be there. And all is well in heaven. There's a God who forgives sins. Don't we need to know that? The God who forgives sins. My sins. Your sins. All our sins. So there's glory for the saints in heaven. And there's glory for the saints on earth. But now I want to wade into this problem here on earth. It seems that, in the first glance, all the glory goes to the sun and at the expense, maybe, of the church on earth. The child's caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman, what does she do? She starts running. She fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. She should be fed there, mysteriously, 1,260 days. And so she's there in this wilderness. Jesus had said, I'm going to prepare mansions for you in heaven, but right now she's in the wilderness. So what's going on? Besides that, this wilderness is not a good place to be because the devil's here. She's in the wilderness, and so is the devil. The accuser of the brethren is cast out to the earth. His angels, his little demons, they're cast out with him. And verse 13 continues that. When the dragon saw that he'd been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, the church. But the woman was given two weeks, uh, wings like an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place and so on. But that, that devil's still there. No matter what the care of God is for this woman, that devil is concerned to get at that woman because he can't get at the Christ anymore. Jesus is out of the way. He's in glory. He's no longer in the sights of the devil. However, the body of Jesus is. And that's you, beloved, and that is me as well. The members, the individuals who confess Christ. The church institutes that dare to stand against the world, contra mundum, when the world denies things like truth and atonement and predestination and the total depravity of man. When the world denies that, the church affirms that she stands all but alone. Except for the devil who wants her to give up. Some have described the devil's attempt by spewing water, verse 15, out of his mouth like a flood after the woman to cause her to be carried away by the flood to get her out of the wilderness, to get her out of her place there. And I agree with that. If by that is meant that the devil's always trying. He's always trying to get us to lose our distinct place in this world as this wilderness pilgrim people. He wants us to join its cities like Babel and Babylon, the, the place of production, the place of human beings exalting human beings. The church... It's a strange being right now in the wilderness and just wandering about and having no home on this earth. But if the devil can just cause his flood of water, whatever that is, for now we'll just not know. 
if he can cause by his flood of water to get her out of the safety of her place in the wilderness, then he'll have her. The wilderness is where she's meant to be. The devil, therefore, doesn't want her to be there. So he spews out of his mouth a flood. Well, what's the flood? Talked about this in the Bible study. Must be something to do with the lie, beloved, because that devil is a liar from the beginning, John says. And here our text says he's the one who deceives the whole world. There must be something that comes out of the devil's mouth, and it's all lies. And if you put one lie on top of another lie and another lie after another lie and before another lie and then they come cascading upon one another, you have a flood of lies. And isn't that true? That the devil's a liar. That's true. At the universities, secular universities, that used to be schools of divinity, you have lies being taught the next generation, the next generation of the intellectuals. The next ones, the generation X, Y, Z, and whatever else in the alphabet they'll come up with to describe the people that are being bred around here. Just call them Generation L, lying generation. Learning the lie and how to lie. Learning from dev the devil, that there really is no one truth. We're going to change the name of universities forever to diversities. That's all there is, diversity. There's nothing about which to unify because there's not one truth. Again, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, they used to be the places where men of divinity were taught theology and taught how to preach because it was the understanding there in early pilgrim America that there was nothing worth learning that was not the word of God. Yes, let's learn something from that. Nothing worth teaching which was not the truth of God. Nothing worth living for that was not the truth of God. But now the devil is saying, wait a minute. There's a lot more that you can learn than from this book. Well, you can learn about the potentialities of human beings and that the proper study of mankind is man and that the problem is this opiate of the people, the drug, religion. And we ought to sing, imagine there's no religion, no heaven, no hell, no judgmentalism. We have a judgment-free and safe zone. And this is what we invite you to. A place of peace and peaceableness so we can all get along. And you can be this sex and you can be that sex and you can do this and you can do that just so long as we get along, kind of. Well, you see where this leads people. There's no end to the fighting. Because people have a problem and the main problem is their own ego. They want to be number one. So the devil has all these lies, and he wants to get us. And one of the lies is that Jesus isn't here. And so the church thinks, well, Jesus isn't here. What am I going to do? He went away. And they think that the ascension means he's, 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 he's away from us. Well, we love it. As our catechism points out, he is away from us in his body. We have to maintain that. The ascension means that Jesus is in one place. In his humanity, he can't be every place at one, once. Otherwise, he wouldn't be a man. In his divinity, he can, but in his humanity, he is at the right hand of God. And he's not literally present in the Lord's Supper either and physically present, as the Lutherans and Roman Catholics say, as compromising the truth of the ascension and of the natures of Christ. He's really not here in his body. But the catechism reminds us he is here in his majesty, divinity, his grace, and his spirit, and his word. He is here. He is here. And the other truth we should know is that we are there in heaven. 
This is something for us to think about and to delight in here in this wilderness below. Jesus, you see, when he ascends, he ascends as the head of the church. As we saw in another sermon about the resurrection, he rose from the dead and we rise with him then in the ascension to be with him and to sit with him in the heavenly places. This is the truth of the book of Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 2. There is, you see, a present glory for the people of God in the wilderness. You're a glory people, and that's why you know what it is to say, glory, glory, hallelujah. You're participating somehow in the glory of the Lamb and the glory of the King of kings as his citizens. And so we have hope in this world. Besides that, Jesus Christ is gone in his humanity in heaven. And that's a good thing because, you see, some people think that when Jesus was taken to heaven, it was like a reversal of the incarnation. Think here. Put your thinkers on. Jesus came down. He took on himself humanity. Some people like to say, well, the ascension was his leaving humanity behind and that humble condition of being a human. That's not so. When Jesus rose from the dead, he rose in his human body. And when he ascended into heaven in his human body, he's still there in his human body. And that is so significant because, you know, beloved, he is not ashamed, therefore, to call his brethren... And he ever lives to make intercession for us, him who has gone behind the veil and sprinkled the blood of atonement. He's there as our mediator. He's there as our intercessor. He's there and he cares. And so the truth of the ascension of the humanity of Jesus is so very precious to us here below. So, so very, very precious. And what else could we say, beloved? to our wilderness experience other than the word of God here says that this place that we are, that we have after the ascension is prepared by God for us. That they, that is the creatures themselves in the wilderness should feed us there, nurture us there, shepherd us there for 1,260 days or time and times and half a time as in verse 14 That is, the time of this present distress, attacked by the devil, but cared for by God. We need not worry. We're given two wings of a great eagle to fly into the wilderness to our place. We're nourished there, and the devil himself cannot get at us. You see what happens? Contrary to the president saying that he moves heaven and earth to help people, God moves heaven and earth to help his church. The earth itself helps the woman under God's decree and opens its mouth and swallows up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Now what this means, I don't know. Certainly though, could mean something like Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God who are the called according to his purpose. It might be the truth of Romans 8, 32. He that who is crucified for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Here's how we apply that. Because Jesus Christ is ascension is ascended and all glory is given to him and there's hallelujahs from heaven itself and from us as well, we know that every single circumstance in our life is for our blessing. Every single circumstance. Good, bad, and Halfway between, it's for your good. Jesus Christ is ascended, and he will not leave us as orphans. He sends the Spirit. He sends his Holy Spirit from on high. He ladens us with benefits. He gives pastors and teachers to the church. He gives us one another. Isn't that good to you? Aren't you glad for that? He gives us one another, just each other, and others too. Waiting in the wings, you be sure, beloved, waiting in the wings to join the little flock which has the big heart and the great love for God who is so merciful to us. 
Jesus Christ is ascended. And glory, glory, hallelujah, has come even from the wilderness. When we sing, when we preach, when we call sinners to repentance and comfort with the gospel, leads to just how we can show that this ascension glory of Christ is true. Well, how, beloved? By living, in the first place, as if you believe what the ascension confirms. The ascension confirms the great sacrifice of Jesus was worth everything to God. Jesus Christ atoned. Sins are forgiven. God's justice is satisfied. No need to fear. There's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. That's the first thing. Ascension glory is the glory of the cross. Then, beloved, think of this. Think of what it is to live. To live and have a Savior in heaven and to live as those who themselves are partakers of that glory. Well, that means, beloved, live it up. Live it up. That is not in the worldly sense of the word, of course. They live it down. Always remember that. All their slogans, you know, here's life and live it to the gusto, uh, go for the gusto and so on and live it up. It's all living it down. It's eating and drinking and being merry and tomorrow you die and it's hopeless. It's vain. And all those things that they want you to aspire to with them, they're, they're dead ends. And even if they're good things and come join us in good things, we have something that's higher, beloved, something that's much higher. And that is the things of heaven. Live it up to be sure that it is live in the light of the resurrection and ascension and look up. Let us look up. For from thence, from the throne, our redemption draws nigh. Do you believe the ascension? The Bible is a book to work our faith in the ascension of Jesus, which guarantees his wonderful return soon on clouds of glory. As he ascended, he will return. And this will be for glory, glory, hallelujah. World without end. Start now. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Amen. We thank you, Father, for the word of God. We pray that we all may say our amens to this in a life and confession that gives you honor. We are nothing, Lord, but you are the great God of our salvation. Have mercy upon our souls. Bless the preaching of the gospel. Work faith. And bless, Father, that we can go now our ways individually, but as families as well, may be in your way. May we be resolute in this wilderness where there is no, nothing, nothing that satisfies. May we look up and may we understand that our lives are hid in heaven with Christ, who is coming soon. In his name we pray, amen. amen. <clears throat> Let's sing now the last verses of 124. <clears throat> and we'll sing 4, 5, and 6, or just 4 and 6, 4 and 6 of 124.
receive the benediction now after which we'll sing stanzas one and three, the first and the last of 304 for our doxology. Beloved, receive now God's parting blessing. Go in peace and joy, and in everything, look up and live it up by faith to the glory of God, living the holy and happy life for Jesus' sake. Receive God's blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.